Outspoken Engineer Season 2, Episode 3. The past, the present, the future. We're here with a couple of legends in the industry amounting to around 50 years experience, maybe more. Let's roll. Okay, right. I'm sitting here with Mick Langford and Neil Cook from Panasonic Cooling Solutions Europe. Mick, hello. Hello. How are you doing? Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting us. Neil, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Jacob. I know nice to see you. I know it's been quite difficult to pin you both down, but you are here today finally, and it's it's an honour to yeah. be sitting here with you both. No, likewise. Um, just as, as always, just want to cover a couple of intros. So... Mick, you're the UK sales manager for Panasonic Cooling Solutions. Yeah. I've got down that you've been doing this for 30 years, but you stand me corrected. 44 years. Okay. Folks at home, listen. This guy, Mick, has been in this industry for 44 years. Listen. Neil, <laughs> you are the regional sales manager for the South Panasonic Cooling Solutions. I am. And correct me if I'm wrong, you've been doing this for about 23 years. Yeah, I started AC 2000, so yep, 23 years. Okay, so I'm standing corrected here, 67 years. Okay, that's quite impressive. That's quite impressive. Mick, going from the start with your experience, mm -hmm. um, yeah. where did it all start and what age? It, Not that we want to give any ages away no, I'm, here. <laughs> I'm quite okay with that. It started at age 16 um, when a career's... Uh, officer came into the school called Mr. Pell. Okay, Mr. So, Pell. So I'm entirely uh, grateful to Mr. Pell because he introduced me to the wonderful world of refrigeration and air conditioning. Okay. Um, and said, do you fancy employing for this position as an apprentice refrigeration and air conditioning engineer? Okay. And I thought, that sounds very interesting. Was yeah. Mr. Pell refrigeration engineer? No, no, no. He was just a careers guy okay. that came into the schools and, and spoke to 16-year-olds yep. who were leaving school, as I was at that point. Um, and was looking for an engineering apprenticeship because they were they did exist then they were a thing then yeah you know they were a thing then and um, so I went along to this interview um, uh, slightly silly thing with it I had to bring but he asked me to bring my mum and dad with me all right so if you imagine as a sixteen year old <laughs> bringing your mum and dad but there was a reason for that because the guy I was seeing was a guy called Gordon Brown who was the general manager for a company called Wathies okay um, wanted to. It probably wouldn't be acceptable these days, but he wanted to see who who, who your parents were, who okay. you know, make sure you're going to get up in the morning, what sort of people they were. Okay, which and, which is amazing. Sorry, yeah, Mick, but yeah. in regards to that being in present, I think that would be really impressive now because uh, parenting is really important. Absolutely, and, yes, and Mr. Yeah. Gordon Brown yeah. probably mm -hmm. took a a liking to you with a where you were brought up, right, with your parents. Well, I think so. I guess so. You know. Um, so I started my journey then. Okay. Um, and I worked with them for quite a number of years. Um, and this is where you learned your craft as an engineer. Yeah, yeah. I did a full apprenticeship. Um, went to Nen College in in Northampton. Okay. Um, did a city and guilds two hundred seven seven course there, mm -hmm. uh, and and completed that. Then I went and did technicians at Solihull Tech, uh, in Birmingham, uh, and then started. As a as a junior engineer, if you like, yep. and then a, then a senior, okay. then a supervisor, then I was a service manager with Wathies. So with Wathies, mm. how long were you at Wathies for? Um, about oh. till till uh, til I was about thirty. Um, okay, and, so you you yeah. had a good fourteen years yeah, hands on yeah. experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so 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 people at home and including myself, you know, I was yeah. I'm still semi well a quarter on the tools, but I did mm. nine years yeah on the tools before the business. Yeah. Um, You've actually got four. You've still you've got a solid fourteen years of experience yeah. as an engineer, which you've then developed into a yeah. sales role after Wethys. Yeah. Where did it transform well, into? Well, I went to. Uh, I was headhunted by a company called General Refrigeration. I went there as a as a general manager uh, with a branch looking after sales and service. Okay. So so that was my. Although I was dealing with sales at Wethys, it was it was a lot more. Uh, full on then, if you like, you okay. know? so because I had sales people selling, but commercially selling air conditioning. Yeah, because domestic air conditioning as a customer base didn't really exist then. There, okay. wasn't, there wasn't a product for. Well, there was products, but they were hideous, you know. So for sure, people for would sure. never install those in their house. They were too big and too clunky. For sure. Um, and um, so uh, 
So general refrigeration was would that be what I call a wholesaler now? You know, like a you know just a touch on them an FSW yeah. or Wolseley. Would no, you no, be no, a branch no. manager of a? No, they were a they were a, an installer as well. So they I were see. they were a contracting company. Okay. Um, and again, by the name, as you can imagine, they were uh, you know uh, focused on refrigeration. It was, yep. was their core business. Mm -hmm. But they, unlike uh, Wathies, did a, a large amount of air conditioning. Right? For sure. So a large amount of air conditioning. So so that was my first introduction to what I'd call proper air conditioning. For sure. And um, uh, having been in the refrigeration world, um, and, and the products we had then were fairly uh, limited. You know? Okay. They were, they were things like mast air units and that okay. sort of thing. But yep. Very basic okay. technology. So. so after general refrigeration, you mm -hmm. spent a bit of time at a company called Cooling Services? I yeah I I was a little time at Electrolux Commercial Services then yeah. I went to Cooling Services which was uh, full on air, it was a Dyking distributor okay um, selling air conditioning um, until and then obviously Dyken came along and acquired the uh, distributors during that time as well understood so, yeah so yeah. I was in I got into the industry in two thousand and seven and um, obviously there were a few Dakin was there Space and Pillinger. Space, Pillinger, McQueen's, and Cooling Services, yeah. Okay, yeah. so did Daikin acquire most of them? or they they Because I never got to the bottom of it, because Space used to sell certain branded Daikin products, and if you yeah. didn't have an account, they wouldn't help. What was the... How did it... You know, how 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 did that all end as so, such? Well, they, they Daikin acquired uh, Cooling Services, okay. where I was, um, uh, Pillinger and, and uh, McQueen's. Okay. Uh, but Space uh, decided not to... Join the party if you like, okay, and continued as an independent. Um, Understood until they, space no more. They, no more. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. You spent a lot. Well, you spent seven years at Dakin. Mm -hmm. Um, you've covered several roles. Yeah. Director roles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. yeah. By the looks of things, you you were development so you've obviously helped grow the business yes yeah i would say so yeah um yeah. from 2004 to 2011 did dakin change as a business significantly because um, i know i would like to say back then they were probably more prominent than team red mitzi electric i think dakin were number one back then i don't know if that was did you were you aware of dakin being number one back in i've always i've always um thought that mitzi and dakin have swayed between the two <coughs> One and two swapping around, even in They're the early early two thousands. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that obviously there was, you know, there was a great rivalry between Daikin and Mitsubishi, mm -hmm. um, and they were regularly squaring off against each other, you know, okay. um, in uh, and, and continued uh, so, to the you, present day. So. so you you spent seven years at Team Blue, and yeah. in twenty eleven you. Joined All Seasons Group ASG. Yes, yeah, I which was a contractor. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to do something different. And, okay. Uh, and I had uh, almost, um, I had eight years, eight years plus there, which I enjoyed very much. Okay. And, uh, but uh, the, the business changed. They wanted to do some different things. Okay. I decided, well, I'd fancy doing something different. Uh, had a oh. look around and had to think about what I wanted to do. Yeah. So, and you did something different. You hmm. jumped in the pan. Team blue, team black, team white. I'd what what of Panasonic? Team black. Team, team black. black, yeah. Yeah, team yeah. black. You jumped yeah. in with Panasonic and obviously yeah. they acquired AMP. Yeah. And did you, uh, did you, was it an essence of when they acquired AMP, they needed somebody to steer the ship or guide the ship? There was, there was an element of that certainly on, on the sales side because I'd, I'd been involved in the, a lot of the integration that happened within Daikin. Okay. Learned a lot from that. Learned a lot of the do's and don'ts, if you like. Yeah, yeah for sure. Because, you know, uh, I think people in Daikin will be first to admit. We made plenty of mistakes yeah. then, you know, so it, you can't not when you're doing that bigger exercise. Yeah, of course, of course. That happens, you know. So, but when we, uh, so again, you know, uh, I felt I could make a difference at, okay. at um, Panasonic and I, I knew lots of the A&P people. Um, so it seemed like a, a really interesting opportunity. So, um, uh, and as I say, I approached them and had okay. a chat with them and here we are, you know. Okay, wonderful. Really, yeah. Okay, Neil. Mm -hmm. You started your air conditioning days at a company called 3D. I did. I did. Okay. I, I started in 2000 as a internal design application engineer. Okay. And um, forgive me, but what were you doing before? Because you've obviously jumped into the HVAC industry. I did. I mean, uh, previously to that, I, I had no experience in air conditioning, but I had a strong mechanical background. Okay. So I started as a 
a mechanical engineer as a tool maker. Oh, and interesting. I, I okay. did a four year apprenticeship from school. Okay. Um, stayed in engineering for quite a while. Yep. Left, went into remanufacturing of photocopying machines. Okay. Um, then I went on to work at Imperial College in London as a technician. Mm -hmm. um, so I had lots of mechanical experience and some electrical experience and also used to use AutoCAD. So um, I think at the time I just had uh, young children, both my wife and I were working up in London. Okay. And, um, you know, it's always a mad rush getting back to mm -hmm. pick the kids up. So there was a job locally advertised saying they wanted um so it was an application it yeah was a... it was it was a local company in Purley at the time um managing director was a chap called john Lowe, lovely guy actually and um he was advertising for an internal guy within um mechanical experience understood and i understood. thought perfect for me i'll give it a, give it a go okay and um so 3d um all i would see 3d is because i think they were acquired by hrp they were they they, were. they sold MHI? Correct. We were, at the time, a sole distributor for MHI. So, so we were the only, only company selling Mitzi Heavy. Fine. And, we, okay. and John Rowe started the company, obviously, first year. He started from zero, um, took the company up to a decent level. Fine. And then, obviously, HRP were interested Acquired in buying them. Mm. Okay. Um, you were there for 10 years. So that's where you kind of learnt your craft. I, in terms of specifically yeah, HVAC. I, not mechanically-wise, yeah, but I, you understood air conditioning. Yeah, and it, I, I had... Yeah, well, uh, in total, uh, it's what were the acquisition as well? HRP bought them, but I think that was after about, I think that was 2007. Okay. And then, um, so I was an internal application engineer, so I did all the work for all the external guys. Okay. I was speaking to the customers probably more than they were a lot of the time. Okay. And then um, the, the opportunity came to take an external role. Understood. And um, I've been doing it ever since. Okay, so 2010, uh, you joined AMP in 2011. Yeah, I joined in 2010. You 2010. joined them. You joined them in 2010. Yeah, I so did. You've been there for 13 years. Yes. Um, and have you always been external sales? Yes. Yes. I mean, it was quite an easy transition for me um, because I worked for MHI. AMP also sold MHI. Correct. Um, the director there, Martin Michelson, at the time was. Um, asking me to go and work for him on several occasions. Fine. And um, okay. eventually I decided to move over. And then um, we also had um, Toshiba and Fujitsu. So we were yeah. selling three products. So it was, okay. it was a good mix. So people in the southeast of England, if you're an AC contractor, the chances are they've seen your face and they, they kind uh, of know you or yeah. or you've, you've, you've tried approaching them or you've sold to them or you've dealt with yeah. them in 3D. AMP or at present, obviously AMP being acquired by Panasonic. Yeah, I'd say that I know quite a few of the AC contractors. They probably know me. Okay. Um, not all of them because obviously I'm now... sure they all like you, Neil. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> they all like you. <laughs> so, what we've, so, what, so what we've so what we got here, which is really interesting, is we have Mick, who you are uh, internal. You shape the external sales process mm -hmm. and you develop the team to, to increase revenue for the business. Indeed, yes. And then you've got Neil, which... Is, I don't want to say he's on the back end of that, but the magic that the it, office does. He pays my wages. He, <laughs> I'm one of the foot it's soldiers. It's a nice, you're one of the foot soldiers. <laughs> you're one of the foot soldiers. You're a very good foot soldier at what you do. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> right, let's go, let's, let's get these points. So we've got three points down. Um, both of your past are something that I have to envy because I've not been in this long enough. Mm -hmm. um, but what I kind of want everyone everyone listening and watching to understand is that and appreciate is that we can look at the future with what's happened in the past. Mm. Some people are quite adamant that forget the past and, you know, live for the future. But I'm a firm believer that we're looking at the past, the present. There's been a, there's been a pattern that's, you know, it, things go in cycles and there's, Absolutely. there's been a pattern and we might repeat that pattern in the future and we might all get uh, an unfair advantage by listening to what you say in regards to the past. So, Going back to the beginning of when you first got into sales with, was it? Where? I would say Wathies, actually. Wathies, yeah. 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 Um, commercial refrigeration and commercial air conditioning, the type of products that were available, let's say for a small supermarket or a small shop, Yeah. what was the range? How 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 was the process for, for dealing with contractors then? Well, you invariably, there was obviously some large wholesalers 
in actually HRP were around in those days. Okay. There was another one called NRS, which was NRS. I remember is, them. Yeah. Is, is now owned by was was swallowed up by Wolseley. Yeah. Um, so you purchased ancillary items through them mostly. Mm -hmm. um, capital equipment you purchased usually directly from manufacturers. Okay. So um, you would so you would actually approach somebody like Milestair and say we need some AC and. And um, some refrigeration equipment, it, and they would design it. It, it could it. potentially go through. We, we again, even then, we did it, did it both ways. So okay. you you either buy through distributors, or some was done direct, depending on the manufacturer. Okay. So, um, uh, refrigeration plant was quite refrigerants were different then. You know, okay. we were using things like R twelve and R five hundred two. Practices nice. were different then. Nice. You know, okay. um, you know, it was it was normal to to blow refrigerant to atmosphere when i think about it now you think my god you know what were we doing you know but but that was the standard practice then you know so um so i think uh and and, and when you talk about air conditioning products they were very limited um, okay and really up until although there were there was a japanese influence starting to come into the market i would say in the later 80s mm -hmm. um that really didn't come across you know me and the people i was working with we didn't really see that we were we were putting in um sort of um are these uh, like the wooden cabinet that's looking that's, that's, i was just about trying to describe oh. what they look like yeah if you they if were you, amazing fixed capillaries capillaries yeah, that's it yes yeah just yeah. a standard tv have you come across these before now yeah. i've come across them but oh, yeah. I don't remember they were them. like yeah, you'd ha it's like it's like fitted furniture on your wall. It, it's like fitted furniture. It's like having a sideboard on your wall, exactly. you know. So it's it's that's that's the best way I can describe them, you know. And so um, with so with so with them bits of equipment that were available, where yeah. were they made? Were they were they seen as a Japanese product or were they made in uh, the UK? They were made in the UK. I think uh, Mast Air was made, uh, still is actually, because they still exist as a company. They were made in uh, Leeds, you know. So. so can one assume that back in the late eighties, early nineties, that the UK was producing air conditioning products. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, I'd like to say that that doesn't happen now. Unless well, you stand me corrected. Is yeah. there a product which is, you know, solely made in the UK that you're aware of? Well, you can... You, there's obviously production, to be to be fair, so there'll be production uh, Mitsubishi of their factory in Livingston, you know, so I'm not sure what they... But in, they regards, to, in regards to the brands, Marstair mm. was a British brand. That's right, yes, yeah. I don't think I know a British brand. Do you know a British brand? Of they, they, well, they, they will still, they still, um, uh, or use like a Japanese compressor yeah, they, or, okay. well, they, well, they will, they, they sell, I don't, I'm not so sure how they, how they operate quite now. I know they, they, they still exist. They still sell mm -hmm. product, but I would imagine most of it is built in the far East in various Understood. places, you know, and, and, and imported. So most things shifted that way. Um, but I would say for us, my first introduction to different air conditioning came at, the pivot point of me moving from Wathies uh, to general refrigeration, which was was seeing cassette systems that were very different. Yeah, uh, they were Toshiba systems. Oh, um, I see. So this is early nineties. Yeah. This was very early. Yeah. So well, um, yeah, it was. Yeah. So sort these of late were 80s, early 90s. were these like double double the the really long cassettes that you used that's to it. get. Yeah, that's right. You know. So um, and and the the cassettes, the larger cassettes were. Um, there weren't the sort of nine sixty square things that we have now. You know, they were they were much much like tw bigger. Twelve hundred by yeah, nine hundred. That's or something. it. Yeah. So understood. And but that was a radically different piece of kit to what we'd ever installed before. Yeah. So we all you know viewed them with a little bit of suspicion. Uh -huh. But once we installed them, we realised how good they were. And then you start to get introduced to. I think the next thing for me was was using things like. Um, like was the next thing I remember. The next seminal change for me was was a cooling only VRV system. Okay, yeah? and thinking. So coming back on yeah. the on, we're going to touch on this later with the sales. But mm. do you remember how the Toshiba rep would have approached you and said, "You need to start putting this cassette in. It's the future." As in, was it a direct approach, or was it you'd go on a training course and then you would you would you know how did they? Because it would have been a new product, mm. a yeah. revolutionary product, a design. Do you remember how they used to do how how they used to sell to you with it? Well, it was again, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think the Toshiba product was through HRP. Then I think, all right, okay. I, I, I'm I can't quite remember, um, but there was we had um, you know information uh, they'd come in and talk to us about that, you know, yeah. about that product. So it wasn't direct with Toshiba, they would, uh, so it's through a, through a distributor. They'd have a chat to us about look at the range and and then um 
uh, then we were uh, you, know, you were starting to see the first signs of things happening with specification. So, okay. So things were being um, specified on projects. So, so that was the first introduction. I was doing a, a large refrigeration plant on, uh, it was all ammonia plant actually, yep. for, for refrigeration for a, a chicken processing factory. And they were having the air conditioning for the canteen. When I looked at the spec, said Toshiba. I Understood. thought Toshiba. I thought they make tellies. You know, they don't make air conditioning. Right. Okay. And, and you know, and you start, then you explore, you know, and you find out. And you realise that that's what the client wants, and and you go. So that was so, new products yeah. being introduced via a consultancy level. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah. implementing a new revolutionary yeah. product. Yeah. Via a consultant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fine. Get it. I get it. Neil, what about you? When you first started? Well, so, <coughs> I'm probably obviously a few years. Uh, yeah, of course. But you jumped. Me, but you. But, yeah. but you jumped in it. There would have been more range. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. there would have been heating and cooling I VRF. Think, yeah, heating and cooling VRF was out, but. Notable difference really was they were only sort of sizes eight and ten horsepowers. Mm. That's all they oh, all that was available okay. when I started. Yeah. So you had systems that had, you know, 22, 28 kilowatts. That was the maximum, and they would do eight indoor units. And obviously now, twenty years on, you've got modular outdoor units up to you know one hundred and thirty-five kilowatts. So so would so if we indoors. needed fifty-six kilowatts of VRF cooling only. Mm -hmm. Were you in a position to link them in that days? No, not you, at all. So they have to be systems. separate systems. Yes, they'd be separate systems. And you, you probably notice that now because all these systems are coming to end of life. And when you're changing them, the ones you're changing are all eight, ten horsepowers. Oh, okay. So and the pipe work is, was slightly larger then for the like, different well, gases. Yeah, because they were R22 systems as well. Then Understood. we went through the change to the 407C. Then yep. we went to the 410A systems. Yeah. And now we're on R, uh, R32. So, with so, so. You've been with R12 and some oh. horrendous gases. Well, um, <laughs> there's another argument we've got here. Yeah. You know, we're in an industry with better go better refrigerants, but less um, control on who's using them. You know, it's getting better, I'm yeah. noticing. But back in then days, R12 you could just release, R20 you could release. Yeah. But when a safe handling and refrigerants was introduced, so when I jumped in the industry in 2007, people were quite scared of letting go of gas. Like, if you were to let some gas out, Illegally, you would be, you know, you'd be verbally, sh you, you know, there was there was fear, so that led the industry to bring it. Was that the driver? Do you think? I, th I think. Well, there's newer gases. There, there was two. I think once people were aware of things like ozone depletion, because that's what started things. I mean, the I think what people do forget is that the the bigger impact on. Um, you know, any release of refrigerants is, is not good. We Correct. just make that clear. You yeah, know? of course. So, you know, we often talk about history. We look back at history and we talk about things. And and certainly, uh, you know, then it was acceptable practice to, to release because it was also incredibly cheap, you know, the yeah. refrigerants. Of course, there. of course. So, um, but once people were aware of um, uh, the impact of CFCs on the ozone layer, for instance, the depletion of the ozone layer, the 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 products that were actually really driving that damage were aerosols. I think, as we all we may or may not know, but they were your, H you know, your, all, your, all those your HCFCs, right? So, so well, no, no, no your just CFC, the actual sorry, CFCs your were CFCs. used as a propellant in in a lot of these um, R11, for instance, and okay. and other other refrigerants were used as propellants in in your in your deodorants and all this type of thing. Um, and uh, so, the volume of that, if you imagine worldwide, was enormous. Yeah, so that impacted. So, actually, when and the refrigeration and air conditioning was a tiny part of that. But when they were banned, yeah, and the, they went to isobutane in, in, as a propellant in these things, suddenly we became very big. I yeah? see. And But it's right and proper that we address that. And um, because actually it is reckless to to release refrigerants, and, and there should be a fear factor mm -hmm. with it, you know, because it isn't acceptable. So so I think you learn, you you change, and you adapt. And, you know, as I say, we're not, we, we'd started, even if we'd have wanted to... Uh, to uh, there, there was no recovery units. I there see. was no recovery cylinders. You know, so there was, it was. But gradually that came in, and um, I'd have to say as well, one thing that helped change that, make that change. The supermarkets were very uh, helpful in helping to change the industry. That's what I noticed. You know, they were, they were very up on. They like to be up well, on their environmental it's, credentials. It's really, it's really yeah. interesting with mm. that because I'm not going to mention the supermarket that we've done work for. Yeah, sure, but. Yeah. Um, we had an instance last year where we mm. were looking at putting a 410A VRF and they said, no, no more 410A yeah. on site. Yeah. It has to be R32. We yeah. don't care if it's leak detection. Yeah. Do it in splits. We yeah. did it in splits. Yeah. Um, 
But that on a mass scale, you're you're completely right. That yeah, it drives change. It, it drives change. It drives change. Yeah. Drives so change, going yeah. back to the the roles here, so change would be delivered as a company. Mm-hmm. You yourself would have to implement that change to the sales force, and the sales force would then have to give reassurances to contractors and consultants of how the industry is going. I, I think there's a there's a whole set of tools, if you like, you know. So training, I'm I'm very big on training. You know, mm-hmm. I had excellent training through my early career and through my my all my time. So I think that's that's often overlooked, yeah. and it's something that um, people need to place a great deal of store in so so learning and taking on board additional learnings across the board you know but we have a role to play in our with 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 the sales teams with our internal support teams and me myself you know to actually ensure that we we get that message across we're informed and, and you know and people mm. are up to speed as much as possible and are well informed um but i think as an industry we're, we're getting better and better at that yeah i'd so agree i'd agree we are much better also yeah. fgas regulations mm. as well yeah. i mean obviously Back in the day, we people weren't FGAS qualified, yeah. and there wasn't an FGAS around. Yeah, so course. now, I mean, we won't sell to any company at all unless they've got FGAS certification. And those of you who are doing that, stop, because some are still, unfortunately, getting around it. We're never going to get past the DIY installers and things, but mm. you know, yeah. we'll, you know, there's a there's an I'm, I don't know if you've come across this saying, but um, rules of the fools and guidelines guide the wise. Have you come across that one before? I have heard that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Take it as you wish, but yeah, some people can can get around the rules with with you know guidelines on having to use F gas engineers. But you know, we um, I suppose percentage wise, if that's a small percentage, we're we're still moving in the right direction. Uh, yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, I think we just need to be vigilant on it and do our best to to eliminate uh, any any gaps wherever they may arise. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you first, Neil, because mm-hmm. I reckon you've got a product that you're that you're ready to to, to answer me with. Since you got an industry, Neil, mm-hmm. from past to Let's think of the past because I know where the present's going to go. Um, any products that were what I would call a game changer? Is there something that was released and you've gone, ah, we've got a USP or ah, you know, you you did really well on a certain product? Yeah, I think there's been a few over the years. Um, what is the product? The product. It would probably be a product that doesn't sell a lot. That's okay. Thing, no, but no, it was something on. that was useful at the time and I'd like to have one now, which we don't. But it was um, the tall floor standing unit went very well. Um, is this the tower, what I call the tower unit? It's the tower unit, yes. Okay. Um, you know what, Neil? Um, we've put in a few of these. Have you done much? Obviously, uh, I have, yeah. I have um, over time, yeah. I was made to look a bit silly re- uh, at the end of last year by a customer who's got a car garage. Let's call it your typical tin corrugated shed. No insulation. Mm-hmm. And he'd done some research and he said he wants this product. It was a Mitzi Electric product. And I said... Mm. It's not going to work. He goes, well, we've got an old burner. He used to burn wood and, you know, litting off gases and et cetera, et cetera. He goes, no, no, I want this product. And we put a 14 kilowatt back to back in, took half a day to put in. My goodness, the fan, the the the, the power from that, fa- it heats the whole place up. Mm. And it's used as a more of a warm air heater, which obviously defeats the object yeah. of air conditioning. Yeah. But it, but it works. So you've obviously got experience with it at MHI because they do a product. That's correct. So you would sell less of it, but was it released and you actually, when it was put in, you it, what you know, what's it? Why have you remembered that unit? I think you remember any product that other people don't have. I think everyone wants that niche product. Okay. They want something that no one else does. And I've had a few over the years that have been really useful. Okay. And I think sometimes they're not always the biggest seller but i guess you want everything but obviously manufacturers want to sell yeah of course and you know to having something niche doesn't always sell big it's so, a fair it's a feather for the for the hat but yeah it's but not i mean necessarily a profit th- there's maker. been a few over the years i think that we've had um ducted units i had a mini ducted unit it was only i think it was uh 450 front to back so yeah. that i'm gonna i'm gonna leaf. say that's the fujitsu slap it actually wasn't actually it, it was wasn't a, that was an mhi one. Oh, okay All <laughs> that right. was an mhi Damn. one Damn. but then okay. yeah the, i mean fujitsu had the universal of course ducted unit which now panasonic have, yeah. have had out for over yeah. a year now and, and 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 that unit for us is you know i would say it is a game changer because no one else that i know of does a 14 kilowatt ducted unit that is 
vertical, go vertical. or okay. horizontally. Mm. And in terms of production, it's probably a great saving on production because you're actually now making one product instead exactly. of two. Yeah, yeah. Exactly and we use that. that on VRF and on 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 the pack range, on mm. the commercial range. So you can use so. a 14 kilowatt. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Mm. So you can use it on heat recovery. Yes, yeah. you could do it on heat recovery. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a three pipe indoor unit, so mm. you can use it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be devil's yeah. advocate here, Neil. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could use it on a multi-splitter box using your VRF. Surely you've got limitations on the multi-splitter boxes, or not? On the multi-splitter boxes. So you know you have got like a four-way or six-way yes. split. There yeah. must be limitations there on that. There are limitations, but yeah. on a four-way, you can go up to 16 kilowatt on one port. Can you? You can, yes. We do two different four-way boxes. We do a 4160, which is up to 16 kilowatts. We do a 456, which is up to 5.6 kilowatts. So Okay, Neil, you don't do a 16 kilowatt unit. What, ducted unit? Well, you don't do a 16 kilowatt, do you? Yeah, we do. We do. No, yeah, don't. we do. We do. We do a 16 hmm. kilowatt. What, what, a ducted? Um, 160 ducted, yeah, we do. An MF, uh, S, yeah, 160 MF3, hmm. yeah. Okay, stand corrected. Um, I'm not going to say you're the only ones that do that, but I, my knowledge goes as far as other brands, even leading brands. You, you may know the answer because mm. you've obviously known the product, but I was always led to believe the biggest you can get from one single port is 14 kilowatts. So, is it is there a likelihood that you, there is a you've got a product here that no one else has? There may be one other. Yeah. Maybe somebody will correct yeah. us on this, but okay, didn't realize you did a 16 kilowatt. Yeah. Learn something new every day. Mm. So that's your product, Neil. Nick, what what product do you remember? Okay, you go back to the eighties. So yeah, to, for me, if I was in the eighties, I'm going to go. So instead of fitting furniture, looking air conditioning, to have a plastic <laughs> wall unit, it's like the biggest grace ever. Is have have you what, what you know? Maybe I'm sure your experience is going to be loads, but to pick one out, you know, mm. you know, I can just imagine me you you. <laughs> Going back twenty years of me saying to you, "What, what, what's the big change, Mick?" And you going, "It's what was and what it used to be like back in the day." Yeah, it, what I, I would say for me, the the real game changer that made a difference and, and and opened up a whole new market. Sorry, I feel us. like doing a drum roll here. Yeah, no, no, it was was actually was VRF. Yeah, <laughs> was it? Was VRF because that enabled us. I remember I did a project at General Fridge for EMAP at East Midlands Allied Press in Peterborough. Okay, and. Uh, and that was a cooling. That was cooling only VRF. What there. was the product? What brand? Uh, that was a Daikin product. Okay. You know? So and it's not that I'm trying to ruin the story here. No, 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 no. Was so, it was it a G series VRF or was there? I, I honestly can't remember. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, it, but it was. Um, but that was again. You looked at that product and thought, okay, that's that's going to help us air condition um, three floors of of a, of a building. You know? Yeah. Um, that previously had no air conditioning. Mm -hmm. It was a 60s built building. Couldn't really lend itself to, you know, your, your central plant type solution, you know, yeah. large ductwork and all yeah, that. Yeah, of course. And and around Peterborough and that area where I was working, the branch and, and, and the region I looked after, you know, straight away I could see, you know, dozens and dozens of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, so the salespeople I had, I said, right, you know, we need to start pushing this this is okay you know into other start door knocking and talking to people if you're looking for a, an air conditioning solution for your offices yeah this is the way to do it and and we did we installed a lot you know and but then we we got into other brands of, of vrf product then as well yeah. you know um and they were all japanese so they were they're all japanese what, yeah. what, um because hmm. i know the market share has changed significantly yeah, obviously yeah, yeah, through yeah. your yeah. and even for yourself neil hmm. from 2000s to you know there's been up and downs and we have your number two you know your two brands. Yeah. What was it like in the what? Who were the brands? You know, are there brands not th that aren't around anymore that used to sell AC? Um, you know, if I was to, if we were to go back mm. twenty years, I'd say so. So Mick, who are who are the leading air conditioning brands? Are they going to have the same? Are they the same as now? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say at the time you had uh, you had Daikin, actually Toshiba were very big then, okay. and and Mitsubishi okay. less so. Um, and then as time went by, it uh, Daikin and Mitsubishi came through as, as leading brands, if you like, um, still with Toshiba there. And then others would occasionally try to enter the market. And okay. Would, would so Daikin were consumer to consumer then? Yes. Well, uh, to, to installer. You know? To installer. So, yeah, so B2B, and, yeah, so. and Mitzi Electric, because this is where I would say under yeah. the Dean Flint days, I think Dean Flint was responsible for pulling 
Mitzi was direct distributor only. Was that right? Would you well, deal with distributors well, or would if, you deal if, direct? Daikin, Daikin, so with the distributor I worked for, so they were all, everybody was, uh, Neil was mentioning MHR, you know, 3D were just sold MHI product. Then traditionally, most of the distributors so uh, sold, you know, so the, the the companies that Daikin acquired were all sole Daikin distributors. Understood. And similarly, when Mitsubishi did their acquisition um, of Camco and whatever, they were solely Mitsubishi, I believe. Understood. Know, so, so there was... So um, when we used distribution uh, yeah. distributors back in the 80s and, or 90s, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're not like I would see them or as people, as engineers would see them now, where you have a distributor selling one or two or three brands. Um, I'm not going to mention others, but mm, there are other yeah. companies that sell multiple brands. Yeah, Mitzi or Dakin or whoever would acquire, well, them two would acquire. So you would open up a business and say, I want to sell Mitzi or I want to sell Dakin products. And then they were acquired for being that set. They were a sales arm as such. Well, I think the manufacturers in Dakin and Mitsubishi across Europe particularly wanted to have more control of those and, and, and drive value, if you like, out of the market. Understood. So obviously, you know, there's a, there's the, if you look at the, uh, you know, so I mean, if you're a manufacturer and you're selling to a distributor, yeah, there's a there's a margin you're giving away there. Yeah, yeah of you course. Know? And yeah, then, yeah, of course, although of course. you know, to to just be clear, you know, I, I value distributors very highly. I think they're a very very essential part of mm -hmm. our industry. You know, so and I'm hugely supportive of. Them. I, I personally would mm. uh, would agree with yeah, that. I yeah. don't know if you would. Well, I work for one, so I certainly yeah. would. Well, you're, yeah. well, you're, mm. but you're not a distributor anymore, though, are you? You're, uh, you're, you're still Panasonic. Well, we, you, we you are. Distrib yeah, we are. But we're, we're also, you know, we yes, we have a direct arm, but we also have a very strong distributor base, and you know, and I, as I say, I hugely value that and support that very heavily. You know, because the distributor it. is two things: it's a different revenue stream for Panasonic yeah. or or another brand, but. Which is very important, but then also you've got the sole arm, so it's kind of two streams, isn't yeah. that right? Yeah, and I think the thing you have to okay, so there's a obviously there's a, you know, some would argue that you your margin is less by selling through a distributor. Yeah, of course. But not everybody wants to buy from us as direct. Of course. You know? So yeah. people want to buy from a distributor. It's about relationships, and it's about supporting both of the. It's giving people choices yeah, to course. purchase in those different areas. You know, so. Um, and and I think that's hugely important, you know. And hundred percent. I think if you if you diss that and turn away from that, I think you're asking for trouble. Well, in so. the, in in the words of taking market share, you mm. kind of need to do that. Right, absolutely, yes. <laughs> you need everyone yeah. selling your yeah. products. Indeed, you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then obviously in the background, you need to be able to support the, the kit yeah. Um, yeah. rather than just selling and not supporting. Yeah. Um, okay. The present. So. Neil, so you've just got into air conditioning in 2000. Mm -hmm. Let's say, let's go to 2005. So as Panasonic, mm -hmm. with their ranges, how have the ranges changed significantly? So when we got into, when I got into the into the industry in 2000, uh, 2007, we did a lot of resi, and it was mainly high-end, and it was Aircon being a luxury, which I mm -hmm. think Aircon was always a luxury. Yeah, yeah. When the business started in 2015, we were like, I want, my, my sort of mantra was, everyone can have Aircon. We got into big houses and small houses and anyone can have cooling. So you've obviously had products now develop to meet residential needs. Yep. But range wise, you know, if I was to say, you know, if we were to go back in time in 2005 and me say, Neil, I need a, I need a unit for a bedroom mm -hmm. under 3D. What would you offer me? Yeah, Because well, it was all standard inverter. It was. Or, well, actually, 2005, well, that was on the cusp, yeah. wasn't it? I mean, mm. But what would you have a 2 kilowatt, a 2.5, a 3.5, and a 5, and a 6, and a yeah, 7? I, or I, would you only have a less, less, less instruments to sell me? There was less instruments, but I do remember when I started multi-splits just coming in. Um, okay. So that was probably early 2000s. Okay. Um, I remember, I think when they first came out, there was still four-port and five-port multis available. So okay. But I think the major change is probably more on the internal units, the styles, the designs. Okay. They're much more sleek. Obviously, um, you know, with Panasonic, um, we've got a huge range on domestic. And yep. that's one of the probably one of the biggest changes. You've got the Wi Fi inbuilt, which obviously now is a, is a, is a, yeah, is a necessity, is a necessity of course, yeah. applications. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty much a standard feature on most of our uh, products. And obviously, not just. You know, there was limitations on internal units. You couldn't have floor mounts on there. You couldn't have ducted initially. 
these okay. are all things that have come out and progressed over the years. Okay. Okay. So then obviously present, you now have a big range of units. We've got a, yeah. you've got, a, you know, as far as I'm aware, you've got three or four ranges of wall mounts. We've got um, a huge range of domestic products and obviously with a Panasonic brand name, uh, it's very strong in the domestic market. People recognize the brand. I know it's very big in Europe. Is, is, is Spain, is Panasonic one of the biggest in Spain? or the, is, mm. I, I know everywhere I'm in Spain, I see Panasonic. You certainly do. You certainly see mm. Panasonic in yeah. all the European countries. I mean, um, if ever you're going away on holiday yeah. and you're looking around at aircon, There's you'll always see a Panasonic, Panasonic unit somewhere. Yeah. What always is, um, maybe you can answer, or Mick, you can answer me with this. Some of the wall mounts that we put in from yourselves, they do change. So they seem to change quicker than others, which... I don't see it as a negative, by the way, but mm -hmm. I could see it as a negative. And I'm going to give you an example here. You had, you know, your uh, your FZ range mm -hmm. is now the BZ range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the BZ range is, you know, uh, FYI, if you haven't put a BZ range unit in, it's been designed for engineers. So the covers can come off very quickly, two screws and some clips at the top, rather than trying to force units and covers off the wall, which mm. is great. Yeah. But before the FZ, Neil, was it the FE? There was an FE. That was the old R four ten A version. So what? So what? Um. So why is that? Was that just a coincidence of gases and new designs, or yeah. or is there a is there a constant change in Panasonic to to bring out new products? The, is it led from Japan? How yeah, how does that? The, well, there is a constant change. There's no doubt about that. We've just brought out new Z versions now on Ethereas, also on TZs. They're constantly looking at increasing efficiencies on the units. Okay. Um, yeah. Increasing design features. Okay. We've just had new TZs come out, which have been, um, which have, have a product called Nano X, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm. They're in. They never used to have it, and they've just brought it into the standard range now as well. Okay. So they're constantly looking at getting um, improvements on the units. And you touched on earlier about your vertical ducted. Um, I know other manufacturers, especially the market leaders, have seemed to always had more range. Uh, and we touched on consultants earlier when you first yeah. got in the, in the mm. industry. Yeah. There's obviously a, I don't want to say ulterior motive because it's actually, just, that's a bit more negative, but there's obviously a positive thing here that you're looking at a range, you're going to look at having a, a range of systems which can possibly be a niche or can sway a design by being able to offer them more. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think. Or is that, a, is that a known, you know, is it like an underdog thing behind the scenes at Panasonic to say, well, We've got this product. We've got this product. They can't offer that. Is that something that's trying to be? Because all of these improvements, yeah. will which have got to Nano X, obviously yeah. being a, yeah. a niche product, yeah. is that a direct strategy, or is it just something which is just well, more, I think, more yeah, natural? I think any manufacturers, any any developing manufacturer, you know, and, a Pan, and, and Panasonic, uh, recognised through the uh, you know through the consumer world, you know, as a as a company that seeks and innovates. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, and Neil alluded to it as well, you know, with change, and we're always we always want the USP, you know. So we do have a number of things like that. So we're always looking for that because ultimately, if you look at, you can lay all the various catalogs out in front of you, you know. There's, a, you know, dare I say, a cassette as a cassette as a cassette. You yeah. know, um, pipe lengths are similar, you know, um, and and refrigerant charges, pipes are all those things. Dimensions similar are all very similar. Yeah, of course, you know, there's, of there's course. Quite slight differences, weights, etc. You look at all that. So then it's really what are the dividing lines, you know? So, you you know, obviously I think where, you know, efficiency, energy efficiency is going to be major, you know, mm -hmm. going forward. So we're, we we spend a lot of time and we are starting to look at that very closely, mm -hmm. do a lot of comparison work there. Um, and things we touched on on Nano X, but I think we should talk about that in a slightly different way. We can talk about that hopefully a bit later as well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but we have other things like we do, on VRF, we have off-coil temperature control, which is... I was about to say that. Yeah. So, yeah. Panasonic acquired Sanyo, mm -hmm. um, which Sanyo was... Engineering-wise, I never worked on it that much, but mm. whenever I did, because I didn't work... It seemed that there were certain installers and companies that if you worked with Toshiba and Sanyo, because they were similar-ish logics, yeah. Yeah. that they actually really liked the brand. Mm. Um, but they were acquired by Panasonic. Panasonic have obviously taken that product and advanced a lot of it. Yes. Um, but one thing which I was always told, which you've just hit on, is you were one of very few companies to an a a allow off-core temperature control. Hmm. I would I would say we're the only one who does it properly. And that is, just to confirm, that is being able to control the temperature of the air leaving the air conditioning unit. Hmm. Yeah. The difference, I would say, with us compared to others is we have a sensor 
Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, we have a sensor on the fan coil that you can physically set to to do a specific temperature, off coil temperature. So if you have and you could do that independently on that fan coil and leave the others alone on a on a VRF system, for instance. Yeah. Neil, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Mm. So yeah. just to confirm, if you have an air conditioning system in an office, I had this yesterday actually at a mm. call. Um there was a different brand of air conditioning. Yeah. And consultants didn't consult with the uh, the room design. So it turns out there's a swirl diffuser above lots of people's heads mm. and they're sick of having cold drafts. Yeah. If it was a Panasonic product, I could sign into that controller via the, well, yeah. sorry, into the unit via the controller. Yeah. And I could tell that unit to give an off-call temperature of 12, 13 degrees rather than 4 to 5. Correct. People need to know about this. Mm. Only VRF? Or can we do this on commercial pack eye splits? I'd have to check that okay. one out. I'd have to, I, can't, I, can't I would remember. say only VRF. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, we can go to 10 degrees on your really clever wine cellar cooler unit. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, we, do. Yeah. we do a low yeah. temp system that goes um, And, and in regards to like game-changing units, um, we have a competitive advantage with this sometimes, and not mm. a lot of people know about it, but Panasonic do a wine cellar unit or a beer cellar unit, which is a game-changer. And the reason it is, I'm not sure if others do it. Um, I don't know if you're aware of other brands doing it, but I'm not but they oversize the indoor unit. So you'd put a seven kilowatt or six kilowatt indoor unit in, mm. and you would put a pack eye, which is their sort of commercial elite range of outdoors, three and a half kilowatt range. And you flood the evaporator and it allows you to, they allow you to reduce the temperature to 10 degrees. Correct. I'm going to say something here, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong people at home or yourselves, but if we put, there are one or two other refrigeration manufacturers that do a split type, but you are like a quarter of the price. You mm. are you make mm. installation costs significantly mm. less, and it's significantly less to install because it's an air conditioning product. It's it's pretty game changer to me. It is, yeah. and it has lots of applications as well. We've done we do we do promote that system. Mm. Um, I think you should promote um, it better. And the reason for that is Neil is I never forget um, a beer seller I did years ago in London, at a health and tropical medicine place, and. We spent three days installing it, and um, you you'd be aware of this, having your refrigeration <laughs> background. But <laughs> yes. you would fit a Corel controller, That's and then it. you have to do all the wiring. That's it. Yes. Oh yeah. And yeah. it takes time. Mm -hmm. it, and yeah. it, and it and it would only need to be twelve, thirteen degrees consistent because mm. it was medicine. That's it. We would get around that with your product. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We've. Done, I mean, there's lots of applications. Really, we do food preparers. Um, we do wine, quite a lot of wine, wine. We've done quite a few of your products with this. Yeah. Yeah. And they love it because of the cost. You give them two costs, you know, one double the price or one half the mm. price. And they're oh. like, what, what's the difference? Well, this is the same. does the same thing. Mm. I think yeah. we've done some bin stores as well. I think there was a we have, yeah. we did a bin yeah, store. Where they had to keep the rubbish cool so that it didn't smell, you know? Interesting. If Weird, you, but in, you know, but you, if you can tie that, if you can, stores. if you can, if you can tally that up with Nano X, you're reducing the smell <laughs> and with two with fewer well, well, as well. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. interesting. What's the biggest you can do on that, Neil? Uh, well, we do. What do we go up to? We go up to um, we go up to 14 kilowatt outdoor units, but it would be a, a twin type system, so you'd have two indoor units. Yeah. Understood. There's, yeah. there's quite a decent range. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Let's look at the future here. So. I saw a post recently that Nano X, which is Panasonic's revolutionary, revolutionary air purification system, mm -hmm. is being put in Range Rovers. And I think Chris Harris from Top Gear mentioned this. He did. Is it, an, is it a Panasonic product? Yeah, absolutely. It's a unique product of Panasonic's. Okay. Originally, it was Nano. Then it was Nano G. Yeah. Continuing development. And now it's Nano X. Mm. Do we know if it's staying Nano X? Yeah, I'd say that's that's fair to say that's the brand name. It's, it's been brand, patented. Yeah. It's yeah. a brand name. Yeah. It's been developed all the time because we've got different generations um, which produce more uh, OH radicals. I think okay. we, so need Neil, to explain, I'm stop we need you to explain right now. a little yeah. bit more about how it works. I might so before yeah. we did this this morning, Jonathan next door said, Neil has showed me the video. Yeah, you can You can actually rate Neil on what he's about to do. Jonathan has said... Ask Neil during the podcast. He has showed me the video and, and showed us the document, but I don't get it. I mm. want a layman's okay. approach to how this product works mm -hmm. because it'll be a lot easier. And I'm going to agree with him, because not to say that you've not explained it well, but you mentioned OH radicals, and I think of a band from the 90s, um, which were something, new, mm. new Age Radicals or something. Um, mm. 
explain because there are other brands which have their own purification devices we'll yeah. just name a few it was lg quad plasma which i think mm. was bought by mitzi electric who have a quad plasma which is a great system uses electricity to clean the air mm. they can have a similar system which is the streamer mm -hmm. and toshiba have a system and you have a system but your system is different very different it is the only system which does this and you're patented mm. so first things first was this product produced, before you explain it, was this product produced as a result of COVID or was it no. something which was being produced no, anyway? Definitely not. No. It's been around for 20 years, is that correct? Yeah, it, it, so it's been developed a long time ago. And obviously in Japan, I think air quality was probably, hmm. um, you know, um, people cared about air quality a lot more in Japan than probably they do hmm. in the UK. Okay. So, um, but so, obviously the COVID came along and... Yeah. It was a, a, a great seller of ours because, you know, of of what it does. I, th I think the thing is, as Neil quite rightly says, you know, so 97 was when they first started development. Yeah. Launched in 2003 was the first version. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had the Mark 1 sort of 2015-ish, I think. 14, something the like that. Development, out to market, yeah. and then continued improvement. Continued improvement. So, and then at 20... So the interesting thing was, uh, you know... 2019 was uh year of the covid yeah, well actually 2020 wasn't it so it was 2019 we actually launched our uh the mark ii version nano g uh nano i'd say nano x nano x yeah so uh, and we're now just launching um the version three that's that's what's that going to be called that's still be called nano x it's just, just uh, the difference is it's the volume of hydro and when, when we talked about oh radicals it's the when you talk about layman's terms yeah. i would say so what we're doing very simply i say it's not a simple thing but we're without getting to the mechanics don't of the, give neil any pointers for what he's got to do <laughs> <laughs> well essentially we're taking um oh radicals and combining them with moisture in the air all right so yeah. oh radicals were around us all the time we bring those two things together to create a hydroxyl radical. Okay. And then we're jetting those into the space. So the third series of Nano X produces more of these radicals. Yeah, trillions Correct. upon trillions. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, Neil. Yes. I've heard about Nano X. I'm going to be green here, right? Mm -hmm. I've heard about this Nano X from a friend. What is Nano X? It's an air purifier and it cleans the air, but can you explain to me how it works? For, as Albert Einstein said, if it's over, if it's if it, if a child can't understand it, it's overcomplicated. So explain it to a six-year-old, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, inside the aircon unit, we have like a nano EX generator. So okay. a small device that generates um, the OH radicals and encapsulates them. In what moisture. is an OH radical? An OH radical is um, a, a molecule okay. that um, is produced naturally by the sun's. Mm rays on the ozone layer so they are they're considered as nature they call them nature's detergent so it's natural it it's is, natural yeah. Absolutely. but natural. they're short-lived they don't last long understood so they're very unstable understood so what panasonic do is encapsulate these small oh radicals in moisture in the water so, molecule so the, the nano x creates these radicals or it doesn't it captures it from the air it, it's 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 so they're already here. Yeah, right? they're around they're us, around now, us they, right now. As Neil quite rightly says, they last for uh, less than a second. Okay. All right. So, um, so their impact is minimised because of that. Yeah. You know, because they're they're yeah. here and gone. Here so and gone, they're right? in the room. They're dead. They're so, alive. They're dead. So, they're alive. So, that, so if you what we do with our technology, we we capture them, combine them with moisture, which is already in the air. So we, yeah. you know, we've got moisture around us now. So we're taking those two. We're taking the OH radicals, we're taking the moisture in the atmosphere, yeah. combining those. So we're enveloping the OH radical in moisture, okay. which makes it a hydroxyl radical. So just to confirm, mm -hmm. for a six-year-old, you have a box on the wall, which is called the aircon unit. Mm -hmm. Inside it, we have a generator. Mm -hmm. The generator collects the OH radicals from the air, puts mm -hmm. it in water droplets, and we call it hydroxyl radicals. radical. And then that is put into the air. Mm -hmm. And we're pushing those into the space. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes them last longer. Correct. Yeah. So they can get to where they need to do the ah. job. The job, yeah. So you're enhancing nature's the, natural ability. The lifespan Neil, of, we are enhancing the lifespan of OH radicals. But how long they, how long do they last? Up to six hundred times longer. So I think it's mm. what, six hundred seconds? Six hundred seconds. To six, I think it's yeah, six hundred seconds. Ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah, ten minutes. So, so. Neil, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. 
you I thought now? your unit made OH radicals. So, to confirm, you're collecting the OH radicals, which is nature's friend, which is produced by the sun, it's everywhere around us, and you're making them last longer, and you're putting them in the air. What are the benefits of OH radicals for, for us? So if nature's, if we didn't need your generator and there was more OH radicals that lasted longer, mm. what is the benefits of that? Is it, which is the benefit of your product? So it's killing germs, bacteria, not, smell. Not, what, 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 what do they do? The, the idea is the OH radicals will fill up the room over a period of time. Yes. And because they're nano size, they can penetrate fabrics or pen yes. okay. penetrate um, furnishings. Okay. Um, and they will... Um, attach themselves to airborne or surface viruses. And the, the reaction is, uh, once the OH radical attaches itself to a virus, it will um, pull off the hydrogen layer of the, of the virus. Mm, okay. And then that inhibits the virus. I see. That's the yeah. principle behind how it works. So, just to confirm, Nano X, no one has the same type of... No one can collect OH radicals in the market. Everyone else is using a system to clean the air. They're not collecting OH radicals to then. I, th I think you've got the the distinction is you've got systems that do ionization. Yes. Yeah? Um, ours is not ionization. And is ionization, no. which we we say you know electricity. It's kind of like electrostatic filters. Yeah. I that's, see. That's and 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 the you know I would say the competitors have a slightly more sophisticated version of that. Yeah. But but it's not what we're doing. Understood. So we, the so the benefits. Well, the benefits is we're filling up the room with OH radicals. So over a period of time, the room is getting flooded and flooded with OH so it's radicals. Cleaning the air. Hmm. It's, it's helping. So the air, to, it's so helping it's, to purify the air. It's also helping to inhibit viruses. The fact that it pushes um, OH radicals out of the aircon unit and it fills up the room, it gets to places where other systems wouldn't hmm. okay. necessarily. So if I was coughing and sputtering here at the moment. And the uh, we had a Nano X device in here. Yeah, it would it would basically reduce the risk of other people getting the cough. It, it's it's going to help. It's going to yeah, help. It's going to help. I think yeah, yeah it's going to help. You. you know, that's the thing. I would, you know, I, we're not trying to. Uh, we're not going to make a standpoint. It's the same with ionizers, as you rightly yeah. put. You can yeah. never make the uh, hmm. the assumption that it's going to one hundred percent. You know, it's not going to. It's not going to be a cure for cancer or or, oh, no, or no. 100 percent rule things out. Uh, that's way beyond what we're discussing mm. here. But it contributes to. Does it remove smells? It helps in inhibit yeah. odors because yeah. if we're spraying yeah. aerosol in here, it it'll obviously inhibit yeah. inhibit odors. Mm. Okay, so a six year old question, which I'm going to try and get to here, is when you turn the unit on into um, nano X mode, does it smell? Does it cause any smells? Does the does the unit produce a smell? If if you were to put your nose right up to it, yeah, yeah. you could detect a slight what I call like ozone. Oh, really? Yeah, slightly. But if you're you come into us, if we're sat here, for instance, yeah, yeah you wouldn't. There's no discernible, um, okay, uh, odor, so to speak. Okay, you know? so it's but yeah, certainly. Oh, if I didn't. You, I don't know yeah, what ozone can, smells like. Yeah, you can you can detect a, uh, but it's 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 um, but certainly not uh, in a in an open space. Okay. You know? So no noise. Mm. Do, when we put it in purifying mm. mode, does the generator make a noise, or is it just if you put your ear up to it, you might hear a buzz? It's a slight buzz you may yeah. hear, but really it's not noticeable. And in yeah. regards to the spec of your wall mounts, when you say you're 19 dB, having then, do we know if that goes over? Does it does it become no? Uh, it's not noticeably noisy. Again, six-year-old question. Uh, mm, is it going to yeah. make a noise? No. Unless not, you're looking for no. it significantly, you're not going to mm. hear no, it. And if, no, and, and, and in a domestic situation, if you had it in a bedroom, you're not going to think you've got a mosquito in the room. Mm, you know, correct. for instance, you know, you're not going to hear it. You know, Nick, I'm saying it. this is from a six-year-old, but I can assure you yeah. some of the questions we get oh, from I, customers I, I get are, get mm. does it make a noise? Uh, mm. We had a client actually oh. um, yesterday phone up with a different product oh. saying, I can't see the filtration unit. I've taken the covers off, and we're like, "Whoa, you shouldn't be taking the covers off." Mm. Um, but he wanted to know where it was. Yeah. So we do get these questions. So it yeah, doesn't smell, but if you put your nose no. up to it, you well, may we, get a whiff of ozone. Mm. It doesn't make any additional noises. Mm. We do a standalone Nano EX generator just with a fan. So okay, that product we have a demo version. So w I've been taking it around, but you can hardly hear when it's turned on. Right. You okay. would never, yeah. you would never even know from a distance that it's on. 
Yeah. So this is your fantastic product being removed from an air conditioning system and actually saying, if you want to clean the air, and the, if you want to use OH radicals uh, with this device, you don't actually need to put an aircon system in. You don't need yeah. to put an aircon system in, the, no. the term I would get used to saying is hydroxyl radicals. Hydroxyl radicals. Because that's the, the difference, you know. It's a hydroxyl radical generator. Yes, that's it. Nice. That's it. I think we can go next door and explain to Jonathan how, mm. how it works. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, the last point that we want to touch on is what products do you think could disrupt the market in the future? So I'd say four or five years ago, control was important. Mm -hmm. Then air filtration came in as a result of COVID. A lot of people have reactively mm -hmm. made things. I believe AI and control seems to be the future. Is there a product or is it a, is it going to be a refrigerant based product? Is there something which you not that I want you to mm. tell us what you've got coming out, but can you see a change? Because we've we've gone from VRV to chiller, now we're at heat pumps, and do you think we're gonna step away from VRF? I I think Or we, could it happen? I I potentially I mean obviously having a crystal ball would be fantastic, you know. Yeah. Um I I would say that um I, I think you mentioned AI and control. I think there's lots of advances and changes that are going to come there, you know, that yeah. will, will transform the industry in all sorts of ways. Um, I'd come back to our Nano X technology yeah. and say that that's transformational in terms of what people do in, in all environments. Yeah? yeah, okay. You know, in the sense that if you've got, we talked about, you know, the, the sameness of, a, say, a cassette system. Of course. You know, so you've got th three or four brands of cassette in front of you. Mm -hmm. Why would you install those three when this one has built that in. technology and can help? You know, if you the, the question I would say to people is, do you want to improve indoor air quality? Do you want to um, reduce the potential impact of COVID infection? All these sorts of all sorts all sorts of things. And you know? you're not really paying that much more for well, it, not. if not the same yeah. sometimes. Yeah, exactly. You know, so if you want, so to me, I think that we need we need to do a better job of getting that message out there, and we're we're certainly trying on that front and. And I think, um, you know, that to me is is something that people need to get their head around and understand, um, and and see the benefit that it can deliver them. You know, okay. um, that, that that certainly. But you know, refrigerants is a moving picture all the time. I don't think VRF. I think LARP. The interesting thing will be large VRF. I think you know. You know, we talked before. Neil was saying about smaller systems. I, I, that was my thing. My introduction mm. was. You know, we could buy an 8 and a 10 horsepower. Actually, it was cooling only when I started, as I, as I alluded to. But going forward, potentially, you know, we, we can see that because of refrigerant volumes and everything else, you know, people being uncomfortable with large um, systems that have large refrigerant volumes okay. and, the, and the risk I, of leakage and all that sort of thing. legislation is going to dictate mm. how will. things yeah, go correct. in the future. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know we've touched on leak detection. You've yeah. got, we're, you, yeah. we're doing an install for you at the, uh, with your product at the moment where... You've, you actually sell your own leak detection product now anyway. Mm. So you've nailed the leak detection. Um, but I'd agree, yeah. Legislation is, is driving things massively, yeah. um, even yeah. with gases. I'm, you know, I'm, maybe I'm going to be wrong with this, but I don't think R32 is going to be around for very long. I think that could be a 407C uh, repeat, you know, where it was out to fill a gap. Um, mm. And there might be legislation that comes in led by someone to say that yeah. all refrigerants have to be under 500 GWP. You know, I'm sure the manufacturers are developing things at the moment to, yeah. you know, you know, even the likes of propane, you know, we've touched on it earlier today. We did. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the sound of propane chillers sounds quite attractive, you know. All the gas is contained on the roof. Yep. Um, sounds very attractive. Yeah, well, I mean, our air-to-water, our, our, our next generation of air-to-water product that's coming in currently is is propane. Um so again, from, it's outside as well, so it's you know, not a so, risk to the yeah, inside so of the house. Both in monoblock and and the split version as well. Um, the as we said, we touched on the chillers. We were bringing in on R two ninety. Um, I think you know water based solutions will definitely increase. Mm -hmm. um, I I think uh, I think domestic air conditioning. I think maybe a change in terminology. I talk to people about heat pump air conditioning. I put the the H bit in front of air conditioning, yeah, if you like, because air conditioning can sometimes have slightly negative connotations, you of know. Course. And um, and if you talk about, you know, explain to people whether it's a, a heat pump. I mean, I've got um, 
a, a multi-split system installed at home yep. and, and that provides actually in the current situation but we've got a gas boiler currently you know it's an older house but that does a fantastic job a more efficient job than gas like, of, of heating those yeah rooms, of course you know? so, of course we're the, so we're the same there's, we're a, the same. there's a job to be done there and, and a message to sell to the marketplace you know about that i think as well well so. I, I still say that the product of the year for somebody in the house the luxury product of the year this year is heat pump air conditioning yeah absolutely i generally yeah. think it is people yeah. are you know people are spending money in all sorts of crazy gadgets yeah. at home i still think aircon is the the, the, the yeah. place to be at the moment yeah um, okay, right. I just want to touch on a few things with sales because yes. you've you're just just picking at you because you've both got masses of knowledge on this. Um, if I was a salesman in the eighties or late nineties, I'm mm. going to assume I'd wear a nice shirt, briefcase, tie. I know the tie, and <laughs> and I'd go knocking on doors. Correct. Um, did that change significantly from the eighties to the? T- I've never seen you wear a tie actually. Um, but from two th- to the early two thousands, has that? What I'm trying to get get at here is some, you know, the online shop which some manufacturers are doing. We I personally love, mm-hmm. and the sad thing is, is human interaction is on the decline, um, and time management and productivity is really important. I'm sure that eventually you're going to have an online shop, and that's probably the route that you will go down. Mm-hmm. But yeah, before you retire in 20 years' time, what where do you think it's going to be sales wise? Do you think that Neil will be? I know he'll be 20 years older, but would he be behind uh, a computer managing receipts that people have bought online with a shop? Or do you, you know, where do you see it, see things going? Obviously, because you're managing a team here. Yeah. And demand, everything is so fast at the moment. Yeah. I, th- I think the, um, well, for a start off, COVID changed everything. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. So it changed, it changed all our lives dramatically in ways we could never have envisaged at the time. Yeah. So, you know, it, it brought in, Zoom, Teams, all these sorts of things. Um, so we all do a huge amount more of that. So there's less face-to-face interaction. But I still believe that that's really important and really key because, again, you know, I mentioned before, not everybody wants to buy from the direct part of our business. Yeah. Many do, but also many want distributors. So it's about choice, yeah? So so, so it's, it's some people will still want to deal. So I think our salespeople's jobs will change, yeah? I think positively, you know, I, um, we we will, you know, I think back office support, both technically, pre-sales, providing information to installers is absolutely key. Yeah. You know? And you've got the experience from where you've been in the past with yeah. other companies that mm. you can see where things have gone wrong. Yeah. And uh, mm. which I really want to touch on. I've made a note. So obviously, in summary, in closing this, I just want to confirm and something that I'm going to take away from this yeah. is that, it seems as if, especially with your earlier days and your later days, it seems like you have made loads of mistakes oh, yeah. to make that <laughs> one decision. Yeah. So it's like you've it's like you've stood on a baseball field with the ball being thrown at you twenty times. You've hit it once. Yeah. But that time you've hit it has been been instructive. How yeah. positive that is. Yeah, I I think um, you know life's about making mistakes, isn't it? And you have but it's, the trick is learning from them and and actually taking. Uh, taking lessons from that. So if you if you try something it doesn't work, then you try it a different way. You know, yeah. but you try to critically analyze why the previous thing didn't work. You know, and make it better the next time. Right? Yeah. So if you do that and you strive to do that and you believe in that, then then you can make um, you can make a difference in a business. You know, if you uh, and I think that's quite that's essential. So so long and you but you know you need to stay grounded. You need to stay close to customers yeah. you need to understand the market as best as you can and adapt you know okay um, so just touching on that just mm. to close on this is my second note what current process do you think are going to be outdated which you're doing at the moment it, uh, and others are doing mm. because in regards to making them because we could be making a mistake right now yeah um is there is there something which you think could change that's me putting you on the spot a bit but okay. is there a process where you know what? Because you, you're you're speaking from experience here. Mm. What you know? What you were doing things then, which you probably look back now and gone, why? Do you think there's a current process that you're doing which could have been? I I think there's, uh, if, you know, I, I touched on service levels and things. You know, if if you're, um, there's, you know, there's a there's a really interesting book actually called the AI Economy. All right, and. 
That's um, been written down. The so AI it's, Do you know yeah. who wrote it? Uh, Roger Bootle. Yeah, he's quite a bright guy. And and that, I think, is an area that we uh, we don't yet fully... It will be transformational, I think, in all sorts of ways, yes. you know, uh, both out in the field, but particularly within a business like ours in-house. So we w- as time marches on, we won't necessarily need more people. We just need to make sure the the AI technology we and people will interact with that of course because you know to give quicker and faster answers yeah uh, better diagnostics and all these there's, sorts there's of things. definitely going to be a lot of mistakes made with getting yeah. your AI right oh undoubtedly yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I so there's so I, I see um probably the thing I see changing is um perhaps human interaction much as I would I would resist that personally yeah but I, I see it as a, you know, you look around you, it, it's it's happening before our eyes. You yeah, know, if you look at young people now, look at my, I've got a 25-year-old son, um, and, you know, he spends uh, as much, probably more time talking to his friends yeah, over okay. over screens and stuff and whatever. Than, a, than actually. Than actually. And they do get together. It's, but, them, but they, it's, the, it's like the generations that are coming yeah, up, which are yeah. going to, unfortunately, going to implement this because it's what they've known. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, so, and that's where I, you know, we have to be alert to that. We have to adapt to that. So, so going to you then, Neil, because um, one thing that I know you're you you probably have, which I've noticed with COVID, mm. and I've noticed it this year, emails are just bananas. Yes, you know, and and yes. they've always always been banned. I'm yes. sure you're the same. Mm. You've always I, been banned. Yeah. But I, with myself, I'm probably going to leave this. I'm probably going to have about thirty emails. I but think, I feel like it's only got bad. Uh, you know, more prominent over the less and few months and i actually want to put it down to not that i'm trying to be insulting in any way but i think there's some kind of psychological thing that people like to send not make the decisions and send the emails for clarity because i've never i've never known nothing's changed significantly for us for over the last six months but i get less phone calls i miss the phone calls and it's more emails because they're a lot easier and you know, it's like we need to unplug ourselves from the phones to not see the emails. Mm. Do you, do you it's, have, it's have you noticed that? Um, exactly that, exactly that. I mean, um, it's not uncom- uncommon to have 100 emails plus a day. You know, it's just crazy and it's hard to keep control from two of that. Th- from 2005? Was it, oh, no. <laughs> it completely? Was completely changed, mm. completely changed. Yeah. I mean, the days, the early days you'd go around, I mean, pick up drawings, take them away, do designs. They'd get sent in the post. Um, now everything's done on Dropbox emails. So obviously because of technology, you get so many more emails yeah, of course. because lots of inquiries come in direct with email. So it's going to happen. Orders are emailed. They used to be faxed. You know, they used to be rung through all sorts of things, but pretty much everyone's doing something by email. So you're going to expect that to happen. Yeah. Um, but interesting your question about salespeople. And I'd like to flip that back to you and what you think about, Hmm. what's happening with salespeople and okay um do you get visited by many um you know how how does someone change Sa- sell salesmen salespeople so yeah. how do buying decisions changed hmm. yeah um, how do you see it really interesting and how does really someone change question. what product you use really interesting um personally uh as a as a business owner and this is the, you're gonna have a few odd answers here the first one is ease of purchasing. So where we're a bit different, what am I saying is speed kills. So if I can order something like that, uh, the likes of Shopify and Amazon have obviously contributed to that on a mass scale. I don't want to have to email you to play anyone to place an order. I want to be able to go in a shop and, and order it. Um, if I know I can do that with ease and I've got the support on that, that is one reason why I might change a buying, uh, a buying oh. habit. Uh, number two, the annoyance of having a salesman phone up and email is actually, in my opinion, a massive turn off now. Whereas I've, uh, you've, you know, I'm sure you've read loads of sales. I bet, uh, you must have been like, uh, is it Zig Ziglar? I bet you've read Zig Ziglar, <laughs> you know, the, the crazy Texan or, you know, um, the amount of sales books mm. I've read, they're yeah. almost becoming obsolete. Mm. Um, I see the, the sales process being easy, but making things as easy as people as possible seeing the future generations as a lot less intelligent and being able to make in the right decisions. So instead of holding my hand, 
well, you're going to have to hold my hand a lot more, but you're going to have to design things for, for children as such. And I think me taking away this with you two now with the AI is I actually can see, and Ben behind the screen here, I know he knows this is the future, but I can see Neil turning up in my office on a VR screen with a set of goggles saying, this Jacob, this is the new air purification. This is where it's going. This, this, this. It could be a pre-recorded message. I can really see that happening because you don't lose 100% human interaction, mm. but you don't actually need to be there. And I think that not just in air conditioning, but in general. Um, the last point with, with buying is credit. So being a long... You got your yeah, um, Panasonic and a few others are a lot more flexible with credit. Some of the bigger companies are quite tied into insurances, um, which obviously protects them financially as a business, which yeah. I completely mm. get because they're here for the long run. And what I don't know is you've got customers which are small businesses, which you've probably given them too much credit and they're very hard to pay. We're not. We're very, we pay on time and we're very good payers. But you as a business, AMP and obviously now Panasonic, you've been pretty good with credit. Like you, there's never any ifs or qualms. It's just, it's just, it's not a thing. Whereas with some of the bigger manufacturers, credit now, I think where things are going to become declining with the the mm. economy, is actually been a bit negative with us. And it's a subconscious negativity to have an email to say we're going to have to look at reviewing your credit because of our new insurances. I don't know why, but it just uh, it's it's it sub subconsciously insulting. Um, maybe I don't know if you had that back in your Dakin days, but oh yes, <laughs> yeah. But obviously, with bigger firms, you know, and main yeah. contractors and people not getting paid at all, yeah. I get that. Um, but for us, you know, for somebody to try and and also it's the brand. Yeah, Panasonic is a Japanese brand, so you know, if you were to just turn up, we'd also we'd I'd always you know I'd always uh, I'd always look at that again. Online online is important as well. Mm. If you're not yeah. I haven't got an online presence. People, you know, pe people are turned on by that sort of yeah. stuff. So me, you know, somebody starting an air conditioning business now, the good thing with you, Neil, which you still have that now, is you treat me no differently than I did when I first met you. You're still very supportive. You still return my calls. Some of the big boys don't return my calls. Mm. And some people would call it rude. You know, I, I'm i not, uh, I'm, I know we're busy, we're always busy. You always return my call. Not that I'm just trying to big you up here, but... You you do, and sometimes that kind of stuff with the human interaction yeah. makes people change their minds. We've spent more with you this this year than we ever have done, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's just that return call, even out of hours, just say what's up or what's that message. That unfortunately can be AI. <laughs> uh, mm. You know, it can yeah, be yeah, AI. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. But that leads you that that mm. that, in my opinion, is a competitive uh, advantage. Yeah, I mean, just picking up a couple of your points there. Finance is always a challenge. Um, all I would say to people is, from you know, anybody, any of your listeners, and all that is, is, is talk to us. You know, talk. We're reasonable people. We're not ogres. Um, if if any company has any challenges, they should just talk to us, and we can help them out. Um, finance is about risk. Of course, I think we all know that. You know that. You yep. you, you have to make decisions mm -hmm. around that sort of thing. I think I have a pet hate which is um, people who don't pay our customers, i.e. you. Yeah, you know? of, course, um, of course. I look at that, That's unfortunately widespread. And, of course. And, and, you know, government doesn't do enough proactive stuff there. They talk a lot of talk, but not actually a lot of action. Of course. could really make a difference yeah, to, of course. to small businesses, and um, small to medium-sized businesses such as yourselves. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we, we try. We're not perfect. But we we have a lovely we have a great finance team who are really supportive of us in our roles, um, and all we'd say to people is talk to us. You know, if we if we're getting silence, that gives us that's a problem that starts to create nervousness. You know, yeah, why, of why course, not yeah, yeah, of course. So no matter how bad it is, talk to us. Just talk. We've to always us. had that yeah. with you, and yeah. I think mm -hmm. many years ago, I think I had said we were, and I think you went over mm -hmm. the sixty day payment mm -hmm. terms, which is amazing, and that was just yeah, which is which is amazing. So that mm -hmm. talking yeah. obviously helps. So just coming away from this, have you got any more closing comments? No, I'm I'm all good. I think. Have you got any, Mick? I I think I touched on training before, so I would I would say to anybody um, in the industry, learn as much as you can. You know, um, never stop learning, keep learning, um, and there's there's a there's a massive we've got a massive amount of online um, training, training yeah. you okay. know, which you can get through Pro Club and such like. You know, and and that's. 
So that that enables because everybody's busy, you know. So we get engineers are out and about and they're on site. Yeah, yeah, of course. But if they can get home and they can, you know, maybe it's not the ideal thing you want to do, but sit down, take an hour, two hours, you know, they and and just learn a bit more about uh, products, controls, settings, all these sorts of things. You know, they can they can pick up quite a bit and make their lives easier and their customers' life better by doing that. You know, and that's what we're all here to do. We're all here to make money at the end of the day. You know, so. Um, if we can do things to to do that, and we certainly want to try and so, so, do our so best. So just to, to close on this, so the reason you would choose a Panasonic product over some of the bigger competitors is you have got a huge range of products. Correct. You've got a fantastic Nano X product, which is unrivaled. Yeah. Uh, and also, they still have. You are a, a corporate business, but you have still got an element of human touch, which yeah. is which is yeah. great. Yeah. You've got a wealth of knowledge, ones of which you've made lots of mistakes on you've actually used the learning to actually produce a, a business and a sales arm, which is, un, yeah. is, is, is perfect. It's great. And yeah. it's, and it's continuously improving. Your products are ever uh, keep changing. Hmm. Um, I think that, I think that's all. You got anything to add on that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Right. Yeah. That, that's episode three wrapped. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Jacob. Really appreciate you coming down. Like subscribe. If you want to know more about the Panasonic product, reach out to us, comment below, Get in touch with Mick on LinkedIn or Neil on LinkedIn. Try them out. Thank you.